The Martyrdom of St. Victor and His Companions Masella, the modern Marseilles, was celebrated in ancient times as one of the chief cities of the Roman Empire. The beauty of the surrounding country, the mildness of the climate, above all its position on the Mediterranean at the entrance of Gaul, had made it the great emporium of commerce between the different nations of the known world. Its inhabitants, composed partly of the original Greek colonists of Romans, who had repaired thither to recruit their squandered fortunes, and partly of Gauls, who had forsaken the habits of their rude and independent life to devote themselves to civilized pursuits, were distinguished for all the human virtues and vices, to which their original education had trained them. This blending of different nationalities had, in like manner, produced among the people an endless variety of all forms of superstitious worship. The false deities of every country of the empire were held in honor. The only true and saving religion was held in abhorrence. As self-interested was the mainspring of all the undertakings of the people of Marseilles, it is natural to expect that flattery, rather than love or respect for their rulers, would prompt them to comply with their wishes. Hence it happened that, at the approach of their sovereign, if he were known to be an enemy of the faith, the people of this great city were wont to signalize their devotedness by so cruel a persecution of the Christians that they seemed wholly to forget the claims of nature and affection. Neither kindred, age, nor condition could soften their hearts to pity. One of the noblest victims of this foolish and servile flattery of the masters of the empire was the noble and generous soldier of Christ, the blessed Victor. Victor was a veteran soldier. Throughout his military career, he had distinguished himself as much by his bravery and success as he was eminent by the nobility of his birth and by his personal accomplishments. As a Christian, he was a pattern of every virtue, meek, humble, patient, fervent, full of charity, he was the support of his brethren amidst their trials, dreading naught but sin. It was his constant aim to inspire others with the same courage and constancy that had been his rule of action during all the troubles and hardships which had beset his eventful life. The name he had received in baptism ever reminded him that God willed him to be superior to all the wiles and assaults of the powers of darkness. The Emperor Maximian Hercules came to Marcellus. His reputation had preceded him. He was looked upon as the fiercest of the tyrants that had disgraced the Roman purple. His stay in Gaul been marked everywhere with the blood of the faithful. Thousands had been sacrificed to gratify his insatiable desire of extinguishing the Christian name. Forgetful of his own interest, as well as of his popularity with the army, so necessary to his ambitious views, he had massacred the famous Theban legion because its members could not be shaken in the fidelity which they owed to the god of armies. Rejoicing in his power and boastful of his impiety, this wicked prince appeared to have no other aim than to render himself an object of dread to virtue and humanity. His arrival in the city was, consequently, the signal for beginning a general persecution against the Christians. Many of them, fearing the wrath to come, had already fled into the neighboring country. Others, unwilling to abandon their families, and relying upon the protection of the Lord whom they served, resolved to await the storm and breast its fury. Among these, the valiant victor was indeed a tower of strength. Like a true soldier of Christ, he spent his days and nights in visiting the camp of his brethren. He cheered on the brave, he encouraged the faint-hearted, he taught the wavering to despise the transitory things of life and to look up to the abiding reward of glory that was destined to be their portion in eternity. He was an adviser, a guide, a father to all. Whilst engaged in this holy avocation, the future martyr could not long escape the watchful eyes of the enemies of his faith. He was arrested and led before the tribunal of the prefect. This officer, struck with the noble bearing of the veteran warrior, saw at once that it would be useless to attempt intimidation as a means of inducing him to offer sacrifice to the gods of the empire. 
He endeavored, therefore, to persuade him by kind words. Victor, he said, the country thou hast served so long and so faithfully makes another claim on thee. Thou art accused of despising our gods. Thou hast abandoned the military service of the empire, it is said, to join our enemies. Thou foregoest the favor of thy lawful prince and the rewards which he holds out to give adherence to the teachings of a man who, many years ago, was put to death as a disturber of the peace and a teacher of a false and impracticable philosophy. Why wouldst thou de deify and worship this man and forsake the gods who have established the power of Rome over the whole earth, who preserve her institutions and watch over her greatness? Victor replied, I have served my country long, and I trust, faithfully as you say, I thought it my duty to so to do, because the service which I rendered received the approval of my conscience. Never would I join the enemies of the empire, but I glory in belonging to its best friends and firmest supporters. The gods of whom you speak I neither reverence nor worship. They are neither great, nor good, nor wise, nor generous. Their power to protect the majesty of Rome is wholly imaginary. They are, in reality, nothing but unclean demons who lead their deluded worshippers into wickedness during this life and into misery and torments hereafter. Do not suppose that I am afraid of their power or of their vengeance. I despise both. As regards the favor of the emperor, I heed it not. I renounce beforehand all rank and distinction, whether in the army or at the court of the prince. Before all other things, I am a soldier of Jesus Christ. Him I worship. In his service, I am ready to die. You seem to imagine that he was merely a man like ourselves. It is not so. He is the Son of the Most High, the Lord and Creator of heaven and earth. He indeed chose to take upon himself our human nature. He suffered and died for our redemption. But if he permitted the ungodly to treat him thus, it was because the love of his heart for us poor mortals prompted him thereto. If amid his torments he appeared to the eyes of the unbelieving as an outcast, he also showed his power by arising on the third day from among the dead, and by ascending into heaven, and the sight of a vast multitude of men, there to take possession of an everlasting kingdom, conquered by his sufferings. This is the God whom I serve and adore, and the true and living God. At these words of the bold confessor of the faith, the crowd that surrounded the tribunal uttered a loud cry of indignation. They seemed ready to proceed to acts of violence, doubtless imagining that, by doing so, they would gain the favorable regard of Maximian, who, for the presence, had made his abode among them. The prefect, however, considering the rank of the accused and the reputation which he enjoyed, deemed it proper to resist the attempts of the rash multitude and to refer the matter to the emperor. He said, therefore, to the martyr, Thy offense is against the majesty of the empire. Caesar himself is in our midst. Thou shalt have a hearing before him. He will determine thy fate according to his wisdom and justice. It matters not, replied Victor, whether I be tried before Caesar or before his representative. The God whom I serve will one day judge the masters of the earth as well as the least of their subjects. Truth and innocence do not dread the judgment of men.